Welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started now. I will ask you all to please remain muted uh, throughout the presentation. Um, and if you want to ask questions, uh, please use the, the chat feature to do so. Um, and we will use the chat feature to ask questions when we get to the Q&A portion. So um, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Alex Hackbar, the American Security Project's Director of Climate and Energy Security. And I'm thrilled to have you all join today's timely discussion of Beijing's quandary. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with ASP, uh, we're a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization. We focus on long-term national security threats um, that face the US. So our research examines everything from counterterrorism to nuclear nonproliferation, the Arctic, energy security, and today's topic, climate security. Um, climate security has been a focus of ASP's research since its inception in 2006. And as ASP's Director of Climate and Energy Security, my work examines the national security implications of climate change. Critical to any discussion of climate change is China, the role China's carbon emissions play in our changing climate and how those changes affect global security. Earlier this month, I published a paper, Beijing's Quandary, Clean or Dirty Growth, and the paper examines the difficult challenge Beijing faces, how best to balance economic growth with reductions in carbon emissions. In the wake of coronavirus, this balance becomes even more important and difficult. And the decisions Beijing makes now will likely determine whether it's possible to keep global temperatures from rising more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, which the 2015 Paris Agreement prescribes. To discuss China's challenge and the global implications of their decisions, I've invited Vice Admiral Li Gun and Taya Smith to join me today. Lee serves on ASP's board of directors and is integral to our climate security work. He travels around the US as part of ASP's national climate security tour discussing the national security implications of climate change. He served in the US Navy for 35 years and his last active duty assignment was inspector general of the Department of the Navy, where together with his Marine deputy, he was responsible for the department's overall inspection program and its assessments of readiness, training and quality of service. After retiring from the Navy in 2000, Lee served for 13 years as the president of the Institute for Public Research at the Center for Naval Analyses, otherwise known as CNA a nonprofit public service enterprise linking science, economics, and engineering to federal, state, and local government policy. Taya is the China Program Director at the Climate Leadership Council. She's a highly regarded China expert who regularly advises top government officials, leading companies, and nonprofit institutions on their China strategies. As a managing partner at Garnett Strategies, LLC, an international strategic advisory firm, Taya advised clean technology companies and nonprofit institutions on opportunities for growth in China and the US. She's a regular speaker on China's role in the world, China's impact on clean energy and climate change and the US-China relationship. With that brief introduction, I'll turn the floor over to Taya and Lee for their opening remarks. Following the remarks, I'll take questions from the audience. As I mentioned earlier, please use the Zoom chat feature to ask your questions. And we'll also post a link to my paper, Beijing's Quandary, Cleaner, Dirty Growth, in the chat as well. So Taya, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for having us here. It's a pleasure to be on a panel with Lee as well. Um, so this is a very timely topic, as you point out in your paper. Uh, pretty much where China goes is where the world goes on climate change. So concerns about how China is going to handle the current economic dynamics are, are very, very important for all of us. So I'm going to start off by saying, as with everything in China, there's so many different avenues that you can look at it. Um, and you can find different stories depending on which strings that you want to pull. So we're going to look from the economic angle first. Um, so historically, China's always had two faces on climate change, right? Officially, very outspoken, recognize that climate change exists, the importance of it, Great speeches are given, announcements about different programs, including its own carbon pricing program. 
However, in reality, the work that's been done in China has really been motivated by air pollution issues. And they've done a great job of dealing with air pollution, a long way to go, but really have claimed credit on climate change for the co-benefits of air pollution management. Now that's super important because there haven't been a lot of structural economic choices that China's had to make thus far which would motivate them toward onto that path that would be sustainable over the long term to deal with climate change. Right now with the COVID crisis, we're seeing where the kind of rubber hits the road on that. Um, so COVID of course had an immediate positive impact in greenhouse gas emissions. We had clear skies about Wuhan. There's some great uh, infrared and satellite imagery demonstrating how clear everything got. But as soon as things got rolling again in the economy, we're starting to see the pollution coming back, the carbon emissions rising to rates equal at least to 2019 and likely moving up ahead. Um, so the estimates overall economically is that this virus is gonna have a much bigger impact on China's economy than SARS did in 2002 to 2003 or even than the financial uh, crisis did in 2008 and 2009. And this is a lot because the Chinese economy is a lot, lot bigger than it was back then. At the same time, uh, since the financial crisis, um, China's sought to kind of move away from the energy intensive manufacturing and exports and embrace more services and internal demand. But the internal demand does not appear to be as sustainable as it has to be in order to reduce the vulnerability that China has both to the export markets. Um, it's also less quickly able to turn around its quick manufactured rebounds to kind of ease the impact of this disruption the way that they were able to do in 2003. And then finally, a really important piece is that last year China ended wheezing, right? Official growth rates were the lowest level since 1990, 6% increase in GDP. And even though China has now officially moved away from having a named target, they still have to have at least 3% in order to meet the employment uh, numbers that they have to meet to keep people happy and employed and the economy running the way that it needs to go. So following the COVID outbreak, uh, the Chinese central bank invested uh, 1.7 trillion yuan, that's about $242 mil billion dollars into the financial system to sort of stabilize just the financial system. Um, but they're not able to kind of stabilize things to the level they need to. Part of that is because of the impact of the amount of debt that China is carrying. So if you think about the capital flows that are a necessary recovery element for China, um, because of the extraordinary growth in the banking system over the last decade, starting quite honestly with the financial crisis in 2008, um, China has been accumulating debt at a rapid pace. So in, essentially, the structurally, in order for them to meet their growth targets every year on year, they've accumulated more and more debt to have the growth be there, but it isn't supported underneath by kind of those financial stability that we have to have um, to really support that level of debt. So now they've got this mountain of debt. Now, many people will tell you that it's actually very low risk debt, that much of the debt was accumulated after the financial crisis, um, and that you shouldn't worry about it so much. But the other side is that it really limits China's ability to move quickly in these markets. Um, the capital flows are just not there. At the same time, when you think, all right, what about domestic demand? Everyone talks about 1.4 billion people and the domestic demand and how country companies don't want to lose out on that. Um, the problem there is that households are also over leveraged. The cost of real estate is overwhelming. Majority of uh, household resources are going into real estate. China no longer has that giant mountain, we called it the mattress of uh, savings in each household. They're having to put up 30% for the cost of an apartment or other things. And these are done as very vanilla mortgages, 30% cash down. Not like we can do here. Um, but the story overall is that domestic demand is dampened. And when you have something like COVID come in, it really flattens out very, very quickly. And it's not rising as fast as it needs to. Government's been trying to increase domestic demand by literally giving away coupons for free things on the streets. They're not giving it to every person, but they've been sort of putting it all around throughout the economy. It has helped. Uh, but this recent outbreak this last week of new cases of COVID in Beijing demonstrate very quickly how easily that demand disappears. 
So uh, looking at subway ridership two weeks ago, it was about 70% of last year numbers. This week, it's down to 48% of last uh, year's numbers. So it shows you very quickly how fast people are going right back home and stopping their spending. So all of this, um, we can get into the economic numbers more if you want, but all of this sort of sets a fairly uh, disturbing background for how China is going to deal with climate change. Um, they end up resorting very quickly to where you can get employment and where you can get economic growth. And that means moving back to the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, which are mostly um, invested in deep, heavy industry and heavy enterprise. They are also not the ones that are reducing their carbon emissions nearly as fast as we would like to see them reducing those emissions. Uh, so right now, when you think about, China has talked a lot about investing into infrastructure growth, um, developing you know, new, new infrastructure, they're calling it. Some of it is going to be green, uh, but most of it is not. Right now, they've approved more coal-fired power plants um, than they have in the last three years. This is coupled, again, it's China, so there's always two sides to the picture, coupled with a, an announcement from the central bank that green bonds will not be able to include clean coal. So that's nice, but that is a tiny, tiny drop in a much bigger bucket that we've been looking at. The expectation is that um, immediately the pushes for employment, the pushes to get people off, back on the streets buying things, that is very carbon intensive growth. Over time, they're gonna have to get back around to the other key parts of the growth plan, which includes air pollution. Um, but even when we look at the new comments coming out from Minister Huang from the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, uh, he's talking about how the next 14-year plan will have a lot of um, important co components around environment, but those components are about air pollution, they're about sort of ecology and natural parks, those have nothing to do with climate change. So even the official rhetoric that we're seeing is focused on standards of living. It's focused on poverty. Poverty, remember, the, the poorer people tend to be the best supporters of the current Communist Party. And it's focused upon getting people back to work as fast as possible. And so I'll conclude just to say that while China has recognized climate change and knows it's out there, it's going to take some very significant external push to get them to focus in on this green growth strategy. Um, that is hard to do when you're trying to very quickly get people employed and you to get your economic growth numbers back up to where they were. Great. Lee? It's great to be here. Thank you very much for uh, including me uh, in this small but illustrious group. Um, another thing that I've done since I retired from CNA is be part of the military advisory board there. Uh, the Military Advisory Board is uh, more than 30 retired three and four star officers representing all the services. And um, over the years, beginning in 2007, has been concerned with national security, climate change, and the relationship with energy. It began with a report issued in 2007, National Security and the Threat of Climate Change, um, and was succeeded by several other um, reports which dealt with the different aspects of energy. One was powering America's defense and another was powering America's economy. Uh, in 2014, the group realized that things were not happening as well as we had hoped they would after the 2007 report. That is, uh, our emissions were not going down. The, the climate was changing faster than had been projected just seven years earlier. So we issued a 2014 report, National Security and the Accelerating Risks of Climate Change. And the most recent one was a 2018 report called Advanced Energy and U.S. National Security. The reason I get to that one is that it argues for U.S. leadership. That is, we ask the question, given the generally agreed upon uh, demand that we're going to see in the next 30 years, for uh, energy based on a couple of billion more people on the planet, another billion in Africa and half a billion in South Asia and the other half billion spread around, how will that be met? And who will lead the process of transformation to advanced energy? 
uh, we argued that the U.S. should lead and that it was far better to be in a technologically advanced leadership position than to be subject to the whims and choices of others. And of course, the others in this case are primarily China. Uh, instead, the problem is, of course, U.S. has withdrawn, damaged relationships, denigrated allies, and surrendered our moral authority. We've reduced our ability to be convincing exponents for a clean uh, transition to a new modern economy in East Asia or South Asia or Africa. Um, China's actions of course, in East, the giant of East Asia will be among the most important, if not the most important, in addressing the consequences of climate, of uh, COVID and climate. And because it's now the biggest uh, emitter, we're very concerned about that. And I think Taya has done a great job of laying out those issues for China. A lot of news uh, focuses on the South China Sea uh, as a matter of U.S. national security. Uh, I contend that the South China Sea artificial islands are China's additions to what they call the first island chain, the others being uh, Taiwan and the small islands in the East China Sea. They also envision a second island, ch island chain, which includes uh, Borneo and the Philippines and Guam, things we care a lot about and that our friends and allies in Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia care a lot about too. As a matter of fact, as an aside, Bud Cole, Dr. Bud Cole, a friend of mine who was also a destroyer squadron commander when I was, has written a great book at the National Defense University called China's Great Wall at Sea. It's worth a read, even though it's a few years old at this point. China's energy growth is essential to economic growth and stability internally, as Taya has said. The sources of energy, uh, while we imagine that there's going to be a great deal of additional coal consumed, um, rely in part on hydroelectric. And so in one very important way that China's actions matter to its neighbors. China controls, of course, the headwaters of most of the great Asian rivers. And for example, the Mekong uh, is being dammed by China and all of the five downriver states uh, that depend on the Mekong River. And they're be it's being dammed principally for hydroelectric um, purposes, also for flood control, but primarily for hydroelectric. Um, all of these ideas are linked to recovery and achieving climate objectives. Um, I'd say that China is confronted with three really important problems or objectives, depending on how you look at it. Uh, obviously, dealing with COVID it directly is very important and very immediate. Uh, and has penalized the Chinese economy and reduced the standard of living as Taya has described. There's a second one though, and that is continuing and resuming or resuming the rapid growth to avoid internal strife. Um, China is widely believed to have pulled 500 to 600 million people out of poverty during this recent period of development and the continuation of that, it seems to me, is very important to the stability of the country and the continuation of the Chinese Communist Party. And there is a third objective uh, that has to do with national security, and that is China's wanting to establish a newer, far more influential place in the world, geographically, economically, and politically. Those are the areas where the U.S. needs to pay attention to what the Chinese moves are and to decide to rejoin the free world so that we can present either a cooperative or a confrontational front to China as they develop some of these things in ways that run counter to the welfare of the people on the planet. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Lee. 
So Taya, uh, before we turn to the audience for, for questions, I have a question I'd like to ask you and then one I'd like to ask uh, Lee as well. Um, but you mentioned, you know, many of the, um, the indicators that might lead us to think that the, the Chinese government isn't going to, to lean on green economic growth in the future, you know, turn, looking to SOEs um, to, to restore economic growth or to grow the economy. Um, and you mentioned the 14 plan that looks primarily at, you know, uh, pollution, but not climate change uh, goals. Do you see any positive indications uh, that there might be room to, to sway or encourage the, the Chinese government uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions, uh, to grow the economy? And you know, if so, do you have any suggestions for how the global com community can help China uh, you know, get to that path? Sure. So there's a, a couple of key things. I mean, first, the within China, there, there still is a very strong push to make a move on climate change. And we see this from the experts on climate, including government officials, who continue to drive forward and push ahead in this vein. Um, their assessment is that the provinces and cities themselves would like to do more sort of of a clean development, clean infrastructure growth, but it's really going to depend on how much debt they're allowed to take on at this point in time. So if the goal is going to be to do infrastructure, if they're allowed to take on the debt that enables them to put the higher costs to greener, cleaner infrastructure in place, I think there's a desire to do so. The other two levers that we have to think about um, is first, while, and somewhat surprisingly, Chinese outward investment has really tapered off dramatically, even from last year. Um, they're very much more staying at home rather than rushing out to buy up cheap assets in the US and Europe and other countries. Inward investment is up, and it's up for three reasons. One is Chinese consumption. Everybody still has confidence that the extraordinarily large middle class um, of China is going to continue consuming and will revert back to that before long. So um, in a post-COVID world, companies don't want to miss out on that 1.4 billion customers. Secondly, China's actually made some recent policy liberalizations. They allow foreign firms to uh, have a higher ownership shares of their own companies than they ever have been allowed before. As a result, foreign firms are busy buying shares of their own joint ventures um, with these new equity thresholds lifting up. And finally, Chinese firms have really matured, sort of through entrepreneurialism, industrial policy, other means, you've got Chinese firms that are leaders in industries. And for the first time, there's an attraction for foreigners to buy technology and industrial assets rather than building them themselves from scratch. So an example of that would be Volkswagen plans to acquire a 26% stake in a Chinese uh, battery maker, Guosheng High Tech, uh, for $1.2 billion. So those are real numbers. Um, now, that gives a great avenue for these companies and others to continue to drive forward and push China towards green companies, green investments, um, and really cleaning up the infrastructure. Good news around some uh, domestic demand pieces has been the demand for electric cars is dramatically up even from last year. Um, and we'll hopefully watch that demand continue to rise over time. The third and last place, and I'd love to get Lee's comments and thoughts on this as well, but is that China cares deeply, deeply about emerging markets. So when they look around the world from Beijing's perspective, a lot of these officials say, our growth is not gonna be in the US and it's not gonna be in Europe. Our growth and our future is really in these emerging markets. That's where we see the whole Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the investment that they're making, if you were to track right now where China decided to send uh, the PPE, the personal protection, the masks and ventilators and other places, you probably start to get a pretty good perspective on the countries that they see as future growth spots. Um, so those countries are the same places that we, the U.S., are competing as well. And this is a place where China is going to start to run into, I believe, some pretty big difficulties in the five, 10 year horizon. So while they are right now actively supporting the installation of coal fired power plants and uh, other adaption of standards that are favorable to China, 
uh, these are the same countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. And as countries start to kind of wake up and, and grow economically, uh, they also start to say, wait a minute, China, are you the one who's out there creating all these problems of sea level rise and other things for us? Now, we've done a lot of discussions with countries like Indonesia and Brazil and Malaysia, these key markets for China. Um, and in many cases, they would prefer to not buy into Chinese standards, not be tied down with Chinese debt that has strings of its own that are rather different than sort of environmental human rights strings that Western countries have put out there and would prefer to have um, investment from other countries. We haven't stepped up to the plate. China has been able to take amazing advantage of other um, you know, all of the Western companies, countries and banks and others not willing to fund their projects. Um, but as they work with China, it becomes more and more clear over time that climate change is going to be a critical issue. So a place of where the U.S. can step right up and put a ton of pressure on China is where we to do, as Lee suggests, um, and take a leadership role on climate in, in different areas, certainly in clean tech development and deployment. Uh, we can change the dynamic and start to put pressure on China via the emerging markets that they're most interested in um, versus just putting pressure from ourselves saying you must do this. It's far more effective to go after people where they see their future money. And that's actually a great segue to the question I was going to ask uh, you, Lee. Um, and uh, the question was, how has the U.S. retreat from climate leadership affected our national security? And, you know, specifically, you know, in, in the Asia Pacific, how has it affected our ability to exert influence uh, in the Asia Pacific, but elsewhere? I think that's, of course, a great question. And I'd like to follow up uh, as part of my answer with what Taya suggests as well. Um, a good example of the American retreat, a tangible example, I think, to the people the nations that are important to us in the rim of the Pacific is the withdrawal of the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, um, a, a uh, partnership that was negotiated mostly to U.S. terms with a heavy dose of human rights um, in it, and which has gone forward now without the United States since we chose not to participate when the current administration came into power. Um, those kinds of relationships uh, take, uh, carry with them very heavy doses of American influence when we choose to create them and when we choose to participate. Uh, it was interesting that, uh, that uh, President uh, Xi at Davos in 2017, shortly after we announced that we were to withdraw, uh, in his first ever appearance at Davos, in his first ever talk, said, you know, if you made some substantial modifications uh, or some subtle modifications to that trade partnership, you could write China in for the United States and we'd be happy to be part of it. Uh, that's evidence, I think, some of the most obvious evidence of the opportunistic approach that China takes. We've actually paved the way for them to achieve the kind of dramatically expanded influence that they would like to achieve again, as I said earlier, in the in geography and economics and politics, all of those things are very important elements of national security. Too often people think that national security is a matter of military strength only. It's un fundamentally, I think, a strength of economics, politics, and underlying values um, supported by diplomacy and development, which the U.S. historically has been very good at and has become far less good at in the last three plus years. Um, Taya mentioned the uh, the belt uh, the uh, um, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, that is a terrific example, I think, of the expansionist um, nature of the Chinese influence in all of those realms that are important to national security. Theirs, I'm sure they believe, and ours. Uh, in Africa, the U.S. Africa Command uh, has, has said that the Chinese are everywhere. Um, they're there economically, they're there medically, providing um, medical support throughout the continent. 
Um, as far as the U.S. military is concerned, we have a, a base in uh, Djibouti, in the Horn of Africa, and have been in Djibouti now for a dozen or more years in a very formal way. Well, the Chinese have now negotiated with the government to build a base that is right next to the one we have in Djibouti. Um, again, a tangible example of Chinese expansionism. Um, I think that there are some dramatic changes that need to take place, and the U.S. needs to become deliberately more effective and, and exert more influence in the effort to uh, reestablish our moral uh, authority over things that matter for the planet, climate change being primary among those. While right now we have this COVID problem that's extremely important internationally, it, and it's an urgent problem, the climate change problem will be with us for the rest of the century at least. And it needs to be dealt with in concert with the changes that have to take place for economics, politics, and health worldwide. Awesome. Did you want to add anything, uh, Taya? About US retreat from leadership on climate change and how that affects China's calculations in terms of their climate policy? Sure, and it's sort of one of the questions uh, that we're looking at too in the chat. Um, so the US retreat from climate change obviously has sort of opened up a world for China. Um, to is now the undisputed leader on climate action. Uh, and China is really that undisputed leader because their officials get out there and say, here's what we're doing. Um, it doesn't actually reflect the realities. So the biggest announcement that was ever made on climate change from China really came in the announcement of their uh, cap and trade system. Uh, creating the markets. If you get into the details and look at what's happened there, pretty much nothing has. They have their markets that have gotten going, but they're not effective and they've done nothing to reduce uh, carbon thus far, despite efforts and, and really amazing and curriculum efforts uh, by some of the folks trying to put this system together. It's now being run by the Ministry of environment, uh, ecology and environment, where you have people who've never really experienced and worked on market-based mechanisms. And perhaps to, to me, the most important piece to it all is when they, China made their commitments under Paris, they didn't include any reductions from this carbon pricing program. So the biggest program that they have is not actually, they don't have enough confidence in it to say that we're gonna use that as a way to reduce our carbon going forward. Um, so, yes, that reflects the Chinese kind of aversion to risk. They don't want to commit to something they're not sure they can make happen. And quite honestly, I think there's a lot of doubts that that program will ever really be able to get off the ground and, and make a difference. Um, and so being very conservative in their announcements, but it also means that they're not putting anything into making it work. They have got nothing on the line to ensure that it happens. Now, if you work in China, you'll know very quickly that you need to have things like the 13th you know, five-year plan, 14th five-year plan, and the targets that are set for each mayor, for each governor, and of the provinces, for the government officials, that's what ensures that you actually see the change in the growth. So until we start to see those two things come together, we'll know that China is not going to take any dramatic action. At the same time, and what's most important for all of us to think about, while the US is backed off on taking action on climate, um, China is able to get out there and just talk. And all they have to do is talk about how much they care about it and what they're doing at a top level to be the global leaders. So the question is, what do we do? Um, I am a big believer that getting back into Paris is not something that the US should do at this point in time. We go back to Paris, we're kind of going to go back with our tail between our legs um, and go back in and, and not be in a leadership position. I think that we need to focus on having actions much louder than words here and are taking actions on things like I work with a climate leadership council, which is all about the carbon dividend. We think that if the U.S. were to put a price on carbon um, and then return the revenues collected through that carbon fee back to the American people, that would change the world dynamics. Uh, without a question, because if the U.S. demonstrates that we are able to reduce our own emissions, 
we will then be able to go back out into the global world um, and have very much of a strong position. Thus far, our position has been that we say we're gonna do things internationally and we don't follow through. We need to start follow through and then say what we're gonna do. Excellent. Um, General Seip, who's one of our board members, asked a, a similar question that you just touched on, part of the answer, I think, but I, I want to give Admiral Gunn um, an opportunity as well to answer. And, and General Seip's question is, what leverage do we have over China to reinvigorate their commitments to climate change mitigation? Well, that's a tough one from my friend, Norm. Um, the, uh, I think we're in the process, let me start on the downside of this. Uh, I think we're in the process of squandering what influence we still have by virtue of these scattershot tariffs and, and that we're putting on things. There does not, to be, not appear to be a US national trade strategy that you can clearly see the use of tariffs fitting into. Um, and, and so I, I think that in many, um, in many ways, the Chinese care about the remnants of U.S. leadership in international organizations, which for the most part over the last 70 plus years, the U.S. has been instrumental in forming the World Health Organization being one that's topical right now. Um, I think that one of the reasons we um, have not been influential to this time um, on China's choices about the future of climate change is because we haven't been playing actively for the last several years in the international organizations that almost uniformly agree on the existence of and the human contribution to climate change. Um, I think that if we coupled a meaningful, clearly articulated U.S. trade policy um, that the Chinese consider to be very important with uh, some reasoned negotiations with the Chinese that included um, climate change issues as a topic in every instance that we would improve the uh, influence that we still have. And I think that's really important to the future of the planet and the future certainly of our, of our nation. Thank you. Um, so the next question I'll ask is from Paul and I'll ask two questions that he posed um, right now. So do the financial and economic issues and the short term survival strategy of the regime also point to not enough being done for water quality and security? And he also asked, um, which goes, I think, uh, along with that question, what are the views of the typical Chinese citizen on climate change? So just addressing the, the second question first, um, it is remarkable how little conversation there is in China about climate change. Um, it is not a conversation that you have readily around. Um, there has been some effort to bring up issues of climate for people. But one of the reasons that uh, Beijing has really focused on air pollution is because that's where they get the pressure from the people. Air pollution is the number one environmental topic followed closely by water pollution because people are able to see their family members getting cancer, their children having asthma in ways they've never imagined before. So with that sort of pressure to the stability and the legitimacy of the Communist Party, they focus there. Uh, there's been some really interesting work to get attention to climate issues. Um, there's a group uh, at the university in Hong Kong that was doing a VR experiment where they were fitting uh, just random people off the street with VR goggles and allowing them walk around to their normal places. And these were specially designed to show them what sea level rise would mean, what the impact of uh, much more severe storms would be in just their regular places around the world. Um, and those are very, very, very small compared to the number of people, but it's a start in trying to wake up the population to what their future looks like. 
But if you go out to Xinjiang or to some of these Western areas where they're dealing with droughts um, and Qinghai, like in Qinghai Lake, where the lake is sort of the acidification com combined with the climate impacts and the lack of water coming up from the Himalayas, uh, people have no idea that this is a bigger issue. Sort of belief is that these things are just, just how the weather is and that they will pass as they have always passed before. Yeah, I I, I can't vouch for, uh, or I can't attest to the conversations among the people in Southeast Asia, but I think I can say with confidence that the governments in Southeast Asia are very much attuned to the issues of water quality, water security, and food security. I mentioned in my remarks the Mekong. Um, the Mekong uh, Delta where I spent the early years of my Navy career um, is an area that it will be a very early victim of sea level rise. And um, the aquifer in the uh, Mekong Delta is already being um, salted up by the intrusion of, of seawater. That's a really important area uh, with regard to food security for the people of East and Southeast Asia. Uh, those rice paddies constitute the source of enormous amounts of the basic foodstuffs that are needed to sustain life uh, in East and Southeast Asia. Uh, I might mention also that the choices that China is making to exploit the fishing in the South China Sea while you might not think that that's an American national security issue, it's a security issue for our friends and neighbors in Southeast Asia because the Chinese want, among other things, to uh, have their fishing fleets, which are enormous factory fleets, uh, have almost exclusive access to most of the South China Sea to feed the Chinese population. That'll devastate that probably already is devastating the fishing communities on the shores of the South China Sea other than the Chinese shores. And so food security and water security are serious problems for that part of the world and therefore they're of enormous concern with regard to the security of the United States as well. I, I will add one uh one point from my personal experience living in Beijing about you know conversations with uh, Chinese about climate change. Every conversation I had around climate change reverted back to the pollution uh, issue. And I remember talking to a local tour guide who had a young son who had really bad asthma and could not go outside when the pollution in Beijing, especially you know, in the, the late fall and winter was at its worst. And when I was there, there were points where you couldn't see across the street to the building that was just you know, 100, 200 feet away uh, because of the, the thick pollution. And his son was developing eye problems from being inside playing with a tablet or some sort of like computerized game because he couldn't go outside and play on playgrounds or ride bikes with friends because his asthma was so bad. Uh, it, you know, caused, uh, well, induced asthma attacks. And so here his parents are trying to provide him with, you know, opportunities to keep busy and it was, you know, causing him eye problems. So he, there were lots of um, people my age who were really focused on the pollution issue because they didn't want their kids or their kids' kids dealing with, you know, heavy pollution. And they only saw it getting worse as opposed to getting better. Um, so just one illustrative example of the, the point that uh, Taya was making earlier. Um, I'll ask the, the next question we've got in the queue here, um, which is, is it too late for the U.S. to resume its leadership position on climate change and how the 2020 election might play a role in this process? Well, I'll uh, jump in on that if that's all right. I, uh, I, I don't want this to be a political discussion about domestic U.S. politics, but the fact is the theme that we've been hearing and, and I've been repeating throughout this 
is that America's leadership is vital to addressing the critical challenges of climate change and that it has diminished substantially over the past uh, three and a half years and that it's essential both for America's national security and for the welfare of the world that America re-emerge as a leader in this area. I, I like Taya's comment um, a couple of uh, questions earlier when she talked about not just rejoining things like Paris, but actually demonstrating that we're willing to take actions in the United States and that those actions uh, provide results that are useful as examples of what we would like others to do as well. That's undoubtedly far more important. Um, so I, I do think that uh, America's leadership, I'm, repeating myself, I know, but America's leadership is essential in this. And it's not just essential um, in order to, to blunt the activities of the Chinese. That's hardly the point at all. We've made an opportunity for them to emerge much more quickly than they would have, even though everyone has been pretty much stopped in our tracks by COVID. But that's temporary. We've made it possible for the Chinese to emerge all over the world uh, in a way that I certainly couldn't have been envisioned five or 10 years ago. Um, I think eventually they will be more than the giant of East Asia. They'll be potentially the giant of the planet. And so it's not only important that we reestablish our role in advocating the rule of law internationally and reasonable trade and intercourse internationally, that at the same time, um, we recognize that there are gonna be some areas where we have to continue to compete with China aggressively, and that includes technology. So I would just add to that, because I think that's definitely correct. Um, it's never too late. Obviously, I mean, climate change isn't going away, so we, we got to get up there. Um, domestically, we have to have bipartisan solutions. And where we are now is not a return to where we were four years ago. Uh, so I think one, one thing that we've learned in the U.S. is that you can move ahead and be progressive on climate, but unless you also bring along some of your conservative colleagues, it will not be stable. And so we have to think about the US in a very new way for climate change. It has to be the type of solution that's going to appeal across to multiple different sectors of the US, um, not one party or one part. We've got to be much more inclusive on our side. And a lot of that is because we lack credibility. We sort of have three strikes right now in the International Forum on Climate Change. We've got Kyoto we pulled out of, Copenhagen, we couldn't make happen, and then we pull out of Paris. That's not so great. And for countries to actually have confidence in us, we're going to have to move it home first, and we're going to have to demonstrate that we've got the political support for whatever actions we take to be sustainable and to really dramatically change the direction our country's going. The only other thing I would add on there, because I really do believe that our role within international organizations is really important, but also we need to recognize that you know, China has come out and essentially said the current world order, the way that it's been put together, is fine, we're gonna do what we can with it, but we also wanna create our alternative world order in case our changes to the first one don't meet our needs. Uh, and so yes, there's a role of competition in there. If we want international organizations to work, we have to be willing to get in there and just as the Chinese have, um, in order to shape them to the way they want, we have to be there and be present. But we also need to recognize that this is not the Bretton Woods world order, that there is new dynamics, new powers are coming up, new needs from different parts of the world. And we need to make sure that we're working constructively with China and with other countries to design what this kind of international order is going to look like, to make sure that it includes these new threats of climate change and global pandemics but also countries that want to emerge and want to be able to grow and develop at rates um, which we haven't been supportive of. To me, the Belt and Road Initiative should be the biggest wake up call that our country has ever gotten. 
China has done market research for us. China has shown us markets that are there waiting, excited to move, and that are important, not just financially, but also from a global strategic level. Um, and again, China's done the research, so why we're not out there pushing harder and moving faster is a mystery to me. Could I uh, add a little bit to that? That's a wonderful set of comments, Taya. Um, as, as I travel for the American Security Project and speak on these topics, and as I do the same thing for the Military Advisory Board at CNA, um, I am struck by the amount of energy innovation, that is human energy innovation and creativity that uh, exists at the, FET, at the local and regional and state level. Um, while we are really weak need right now in the climate area at the federal level, the fact is there is an awful lot going on that means that if there's a change in federal leadership, we'll be poised to take advantage of the many local initiatives that are underway. Cities, mayors, state compacts, groups are forming of all sorts. There's a national legislative caucus that goes across state legislatures dedicated to resilience and climate change. I mean, who the heck knew that that kind of thing existed? Well, it does, and it's really exciting. And there are some ready-made allies uh, in this on the, on the, what you would otherwise believe would be conservative side. Uh, the Christian Coalition has a stewardship mission, uh, message for um, their members on climate change. Uh, the Young Conservatives for Energy Reform is a nationwide organization. So anyway, I don't want to belabor it, but the point is that we're not doing nothing but the visibility of what we are doing at the moment is not what it should be. Great. And I'll, we have time for one more question. So I'll ask that and then we'll, we'll wrap up quickly. But Admiral Gunn, this one is uh, directed uh, to you from Gavin. And it says, uh, since China has declared itself an Arctic state, are fresh geopolitical tensions between China, the US and Russia inevitable as Arctic ice melts and opens a new naval theater? I, uh, I hope not. I hope they're not inevitable. Um, we're not far from the time when there will be sufficient uh, blue water in the Arctic, uh, not necessarily year round, but al almost year round, that will allow trade and commerce. Um, one of the tempting targets in the Arctic, of course, is oil and natural gas. And it's believed that there's a heck of a lot of both up there. Uh, uh, those on the call may uh, remember that Shell tried an exploratory drilling um, rig afloat. And even though the conditions had changed pretty dramatically, in what's considered the positive direction as far as the weather is concerned, it was still substantially so risky to do drilling there that they, they packed up their rig and withdrew. Uh, I hope that we can, through the Arctic Council um, and other instruments, uh, come to an agreement with the people who have a stake in this area with regard to its use and keep it from being an area of conflict, even if it's an area of competition. Uh, the US, uh, of course, is a substantial Arctic state. We have substantial um, uh, stake in what happens in the Arctic. Um, and we are, the, our Navy to this point and our Coast Guard have been relatively ill-equipped to deal with uh, the challenges of being at sea in the Arctic. There's a a construction program underway for Arctic icebreakers that um, the uh, that I hope is supported by the Congress continues to be supported by the Congress, but illustrative of the kind of questions that arise from the question of the of that Gavin submitted is right now they're trying to decide whether to arm the cutters or not. That is whether they'll have a a, a reasonably calibered gun or not aboard them. That's that's a policy question as well as a shipbuilding question. And so we're going to have to deal with those kinds of things. We, 
we had an opportunity when we led the Arctic Council three years ago for a year to um, make some important moves. And I don't think we did enough. My hope is that we'll do more uh, the next time around because that is uh, that leadership position is one that cycles among the, the Arctic Council members. Um, but the bottom line is I, and I think almost everyone involved in the national security establishment hopes that while there'll be competition in the Arctic, that it will not lead to confrontation. I would just add that I think one of the key geostrategical sort of aims of our next administration, regardless of who it is, needs to be to prevent an alliance between sort of major Eurasian powers, i.e. China and Russia. It doesn't do us any good to have uh, them working together closely. There's not a natural allegiance. There's a lot of competition and distrust between the two countries. But I think I have confidence in the U.S.'s ability to help them see good reasons to work together, unless we keep in mind that that's really not our strategy. The uh, American Security Project paper that was written not too long ago on Russia's militarization of their Arctic coastline, I think, is something that's useful to look at. Excellent. Um, so, you know, with that, I just want to thank you all for joining our discussion today. Thank you, Admiral Gunn and Taya for um, taking time to join us. Really appreciate your expertise and insight on this very important topic. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation and you can visit ASP's website for more climate security resources and to learn more about our other areas of research. You can also sign up for ASP emails, follow us on Twitter or Facebook to learn more about future events and to stay apprised of all of our work. So thank you all for joining today. Have a great day.